I'd love to say hello and welcome to all. It's Easter holiday, but it's a great pleasure to have you all with us. Um, uh, welcome also to the presenter, Lina Al Khouri, a Syrian designer and illustrator based in Beirut. She graduated with a BS in graphic design from the Lebanese American University and is currently completing her master's in inclusive design at Ontario College of Art and Design in Toronto. Lean is experienced in branding, advertising, and digital illustrations. You can also find her on YouTube. I invite you all to check out her channel, The Lazy Illustrator, and this is a smart brand name. Um, let's learn more about presentation design with Lean. Go ahead. Welcome, everyone. I'm so happy to be here, and I really hope you enjoy this presentation and learn something new. I'm going to give you some practices, tips, and tricks on how to design your presentations like a pro. This is just a simple outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I'm going to start with how you can plan ahead uh, appropri appropriately for your presentation. Then I'm going to get into the technical parts about layouts, placements, uh, how to choose your fonts, how to format your texts, um, mixing colors, some do's and don'ts at the end. And then I'm going to talk about uh, which software I use for designing my presentations. And then I'm going to mention uh, some useful resources uh, that you may not know about. And at the end, if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. So planning ahead. The first step before creating your presentation is to ask yourself, who am I presenting to? It's very important to know what your audience uh, priorities are and address their needs in your presentation. Don't assume that your audience are always uh, aware of, your, of all aspects on, of your topic. Instead, start with what they already know and work off of that. For example, if you're a web designer presenting your designs to someone who's in the marketing field, this person may not be aware of um, like the reasoning behind your process, like user experience, information structure, development limitation, etc. Um, your job is basically to pinpoint those gaps in their knowledge between you and yourself and then address them during your presentation so you can uh, clearly showcase the full picture of your work. This way you allow the person to understand why you did what you did and how that will eventually be beneficial to their end goal. The second question is, what is your end goal? So going back to the previous example, let's say you're presenting a design pitch to a client, then your end goal would be to get the project approved. Or if as a student you're presenting uh, your project in class to your professor and your colleagues, then your end goal would be to clearly showcase your idea and get meaningful feedback. In that case, um, apart from focusing on your strong points, you can also try to identify certain aspects your project uh, maybe would need help or advice. And once you answer those two questions, you will be a, you should be able to identify the formality of your presentation, the content structure or narrative method you want to go with, as well as figure out some methods uh, in which you can connect with your audience. So in my experience, I found it helpful to pick one of two narrative methods. There are many out there, but I feel like these two offer good options. So there is the pyramid and there's the inverted pyramid. The pyramid method requires you to make a strong start to your presentation by showcasing your strong points or your end results first and then moving on to explain each aspect of your process and widen things. In contrast, uh, using the inverted pyramid method means slowly introducing your topic, starting very broadly, and then narrowing things down uh, towards the end result. So choosing one of these methods comes back to the previous questions. Who are you presenting to and what is your end goal? So, for example, going back to the, to the previous example, if you're presenting in class, then maybe the inverted pyramid would be a better option in which you can slowly introduce your project and then get to your end result. But if, let's say, you're pitching an idea for an investor to fund your project, then you can maybe start with a strong start and it could be more appropriate in order to grab their attention first and then you can move on to telling them uh, the how and why and overall story of your project. Content structure. 
The third step is basically to outline your presentation. I find it very useful to start by identifying key themes I want to discuss in my presentation, as well as pinpointing strong points and then writing down a full outline. You can do this however you feel comfortable, but I'm, I'm going to share how I personally do things. So I start by simply writing a bullet point list on my notes or on my Word doc with my key themes and strong points. And I also make sure to write down any specific aspects that I would want to focus on throughout my presentation. Uh, I then go to my Google Slides. I prefer, I always prefer working on Google Slides than other apps like PowerPoint. And I start splitting my outline into different slides. You can, you can do that on PowerPoint or Outlook, but I'm going to talk later about why I like uh, Google Slides. Um, so outlining your presentation is especially helpful if you're presenting a group project because then you can assign each section to one person to work on and have a more efficient workflow. Um, once I have my main outline slides, I start by filling in the detailed content on each section. Um, at this point, I make sure to write everything everything down that comes to mind. Just have my notes because I don't trust my memory and neither should you. Uh, I make sure to write my ideas in the speaker notes section below each slide and this step helps me present my ideas later on and keep track of what I want to say. Speaker notes can also help you avoid reading from your slides. You don't want to present your work by reading text off of each slide. You want to um, keep your visual content engaging and write down your let's say script separately. If you're unfamiliar with the speaker notes section, you can find it under uh, your slide and drag it upwards so you can start writing. This, this applies to Google Slides and PowerPoint and even um, Outlook apps. So before I get into the technical part, I just wanna emphasize the importance of individual slide content. You can easily lose your audience if your slides are overloaded with multiple topics or too much information. This could also lead to overcrowding your slides visually, which I'm also going to talk about later on. But keeping each slide narrowed down to an appropriate amount of information really helps keep your audience focused on each point you're trying to talk about. So going back to what I was saying about uh, splitting my outline into uh, outline sections, each one into one slide. After I do that, I move on to splitting each slide into two or more. Usually it's more than two. Uh, so I can sort of spread out my content and not overcrowd each slide. And now for the technical part, I'm going to talk about slide layout and element placement on slides. First things first, always work with a grid and preferably stick to it throughout the entire presentation. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the concept of grids, but if you're not, I'm going to talk about it very thoroughly. So working with a grid can really make things easier for you as you continue to build your slides and it will help you keep your elements balanced and visually attractive. There are many grid layouts available on the internet that you can work with, but this one you see on the screen is my favorite. It might seem a bit restricting at first, but in fact it's very flexible. As you can see, I have my main three sections splitting the slide into thirds. Then there are my secondary pink columns. If you can see them in pink, they're splitting each third into two. And then horizontally, we have also three thirds. I want to show you first on this slide how I'm placing my grid. So as you can see, I've, I've resized the grid to be slightly smaller than the slide, which gives a more balanced feel to the overall visual and helps avoid elements touching the far side of the slide. I've also lifted uh, the grid a tiny bit to the top so that the space on the bottom here is bigger than the one on top. Uh, this trick is actually something most designers do without even thinking about it because it's almost always visually preferable to have your content shifted a tiny bit upwards than to have it completely in the middle of your screen or even shift it a bit downwards, like it's almost slipping out of the screen. You can actually notice that software like PowerPoint and Google Slides already do that for you when you place a template slide. 
you can notice that your text box is always shifted a bit uh, upwards. I also want to point out that you don't actually have to have to place a grid like this on each slide and work off of it. You can basically just maybe give this a try once and learn it by heart and sort of split your screen in your head as you're designing your presentation. The software you're working uh, with will most probably facilitate that for you by having the snap to grid feature, which is basically when you're moving elements around on your screen, you get this visual line trigger that your element is now centered uh, vertically or horizontally or even both if it's uh, right in the center. You can, you can work off of that and visualize this grid you see here in your head. Just make sure that the white space you're leaving on each side is consistent all throughout your presentation. So I'm going to show you a few examples of how I use this grid to um, just lay out my elements. This first example is a very simple one where you can have one photo, a title, and a short block of text, maybe even bullet points. I've used the secondary columns to place each element on each half of the grid. You can also think of this as um, working with only the biggest two squares on the grid. Other examples will be using more squares or being a little more creative with placing things within the grid. But I want you to also notice that my title and block text are almost perfectly centered uh, inside their big square. So, so that the white space between the text and the image is equal to the space between um, the text and the right side of the grid. And the same goes for top and bottom. This is just to show you what it looks like without the grid. So you can sort of start getting used to um, visualizing it. Uh, in this example, uh, I wanted to show you another option and talk a bit about how you can break the grid sometimes and when it's acceptable. So here I've expanded my image on the left beyond the grid like this. Breaking the grid mostly works with images, illustrations, visuals, or any non-primary elements. But as you can see in this uh, bad example, it's a definite no-no when it comes to text, for example. You can tell that this just doesn't look right compared to this example. So going back to our grid, this is another example using the three thirds, if, if you can count them. Um, having the image filling up one third on the left and then the text filling up two thirds. This thirds method, uh, method is often used by designers and even uh, most of the time photographers. And in this case, it can be useful if you have a slightly larger text than, uh, than usual, so you can sort of allow for more space for your text. Uh, you don't want to cramp it up in a small space. The thirds method also can work inverted like this. So just comparing the previous slide to this one. This is this is a good method to sort of shake things up, not uh, to, to keep doing the same um, grid all over. So you can maybe have one slide like this and then followed by something like this. But these are still very simple examples. In this slide, um, I'm hoping you can also try to visualize the grid here. I'm using the horizontal thirds, although it's usually recommended to keep the horizontal length of text a bit shorter than this. So I, I included this example because I want to show you what a better practice could be. So a better use of the horizontal thirds would be something like this. Um, as you can see, the image is on the top third and then we have the text on the bottom two. And uh, on the on the right, there are four squares that are shaping this white space, and I'm going to talk about that a bit later. This is um, a slightly more complicated version. Um, it would look something like this. I'm using the horizontal thirds method to place the title on the top third and then subtitles and their body of text on the bottom two thirds. 
This is another example. You can use only the two bottom thirds and it would still look great. Um, so going back to what I said before about white space, as you can see, there's white space here on the right. There's also on the top right here and here as well. Never be afraid to leave big chunks of white space, but just be sure you're following a grid and placing your white space strategically. Uh, in this example, you might feel the need to fill up this white space in the middle top right, but in this case, it's sort of giving the slide a clean look. And even though there are no visual elements placed around here, it still looks great. This is just to show you what it would look like without the grid. Here's another cool tactic. If you can compare this one here, I just took this uh, template and I just centered everything horizontally. Although this is sort of breaking the grid, but as long as everything is still aligned with each other, as you can see, I have my title aligned to the left with my subtitle with my body of text and the spaces between each elements are consistent. As long as you have this, you can sort of break the grid a bit with text. This is taking the structure a step further and adding some visuals. So I've pushed my title to the top third and uh, I've placed my text on almost only the uh, bottom third and I've kept the middle third for subtitles and visuals. Final example, this is another thing I like to do which is leave the first vertical section on the left here empty and then fill up my title and text uh, in the next two sections. And then again, leave one more empty section here and then place my image. So my image here, I've, I've broken the grid with my image. I've expanded it to the, to the far ends of my slide, but this could also work if uh, you're just cropping your image into the grid. It would still look really good. So those were just some ways you can use this type of grid to design your slides. I really encourage you guys to give it a shot and try to arrange some content in different ways by following this grid. Um, if you guys are interested, I can make sure to send out a transparent image of uh, this grid template so you can place it on any slide and try to arrange your content. Please feel free to be creative. You don't have to use the specific examples I just showed you here. You can try to create your own, but just keep following the grid. So moving on, I think you guys may have noticed that I'm formatting my text in a certain way here. So this is what I'm going to be talking about next. Fonts and text formats. These are basically the three points you should be thinking about when choosing your font. First of all, keep it simple, avoid decorative fonts. Second of all, sans serif fonts are more preferable than serif, especially for bodies of text. And big font families allow for more flexibility. I'm gonna tackle each one of these points one by one and expand on them a bit. So keeping it simple and avoiding decorative fonts. Don't go out of your way to pick a font that looks weird or show special traits like overly thin or overly thick lines. Um, it can just be very distracting for your audience. And when I said decorative before, uh, I was talking about fonts that are like show offy, for example, or something that looks like cursive or typewriter or handwriting fonts or anything that just looks too funny. This is really important, as I was saying before, especially for body text. You can, you can be a bit flexible if you're working with um, titles. You can be flexible with weights and shapes, but always keep your body text as simple as and as easily readable as possible. So here on the left, you can see some examples of bad choices that you can choose for your body of text. And um, on the right here, you can see some good examples. I've, I've written the name of each font as well, so you can get an idea of the good ones out there. If you're using Google Slides, you can actually access a huge variety of fonts through Google Font. You can also check them out on googlefonts.com. 
but uh, Google Slides offer you to access uh, a huge selection of Google fonts directly through their interface. So you can just click on the font dropdown in your interface and select more fonts. And then you'll get an entire list uh, of very nice fonts you can choose from, and they're all web friendly. So talking about serif versus sans serif, there are basically two types of fonts out there, which are serif and sans serif. So here, Times New Roman, this is an example of a serif font. They usually have extra decorative strokes, as you can see here at the end of each line in the letter. And they give off this sort of old textbook feel. On the other hand, we have sans serif fonts like this. They're more modern and they have a simpler finish to them. As you can see here on the right, um, sans serif fonts are usually more preferable in presentation design, especially for bodies of text, because they're way easier to read and they're just more relaxing to look at. They're less distracting. Serif font fonts are a bit more decorative, and I sometimes like to use them for big titles, like you can see in the example here below. And if you look at the example above, the font here as a body text, it doesn't look wrong, but if you're trying to go for a modern and simple, classy look for your presentation, I, I would always recommend a simple sans serif font like this one here below. Now, talking about font families. A font family is basically the different weights and styles one font type can have. Those styles have nothing to do with the bold, italic, and underline uh, options that are built into your PowerPoint. These are the styles that were created by the person who designed this font to begin with, which means that they will automatically look way better and more balanced than if you just click bold, for example, on your software, because the designer actually worked and um, measured each letter on its own. So the entire, um, paragraph or title you're writing is going to look more balanced if you're using options from your um, font family. So the bigger the font family is, the more flexibility you're going to have installing your text elements. And uh, as you can see in this example, the font uh, Montserrat, it's actually one of my favorite fonts. It has nine different styles. I'm just showing you um, a few of them here. Moving on to text formatting. Formatting your text before you really get into designing your slides is a very good practice. It will help you stay consistent throughout your presentation and actually speed up the process for you. So staying consistent throughout all of your slides is very important and it helps you keep your audience engaged with your topic instead of being distracted by different text formats happening all over the place. And this also applies to everything else like colors, images, icon designs, and so on. I'm going to talk about um, those other elements in a few, but for now, here's how you should be thinking about uh, formatting your text. Start by deciding the styles for each of the following text types, headings, subheadings, and body text. Captions are optional. It depends if they apply to, to your presentation, if you want to include captions. So it's, it's usually okay to choose up to two fonts for your presentation, but even one font with a big family is usually okay. Um, in the example you see on the slide, I have my heading and the font impact set to 30 points, and then my subheading, text, and caption all set to the same font, Monsera. So in this case, I'm only using a different font for my big titles. Um, so each are in different weight and size. As you can see, my subtitles uh, are in all caps and they're slightly bolder and bigger than my body of text. And um, I usually like to leave my captions uh, in thinner lines and in italics so I can differentiate them from the body of text. It's also very visually pleasing to have your titles in big block letters because it just gives more structure to, to to the slide overall. Going back to my previous grid examples, if you guys can remember them, 
uh, I'm just going to go back to them. If you can see here how I applied my text formatting to my title, subtitle, and body text. And keeping this consistent all throughout uh, the presentation is very important. All right, so I'm going to talk a bit about choosing your colors and matching different colors with each other. Starting with color psychology, here are some examples of the meanings behind some of the basic colors. So red can resemble excitement, strength, uh, love, and energy. However, it can also be alarming and sometimes used to grab attention. So I'm saying this because there is no one rule to how you can choose your colors. You just have to place them strategically and, and think about what you mean when you're choosing a certain color. So here we have orange is uh, mostly confident, successful, and a social color. But it's also been proven that orange is one of the least favorite color for people, especially for women. And I personally agree with that. It's not one of my favorite colors. So we have yellow. It's uh, optimism, creativity, happiness. Yellow is just a very happy color um, in general. We have green. Green can be about nature, healing, good health, prosperity, but it can also, when used in other ways, it can also resemble money, good fortune, and positivity. Blue is one of my favorite colors to use in formal presentations. It resembles trust, peace, loyalty, competence, and it's just a very classy color to work with. Uh, moving on to pink, pink is considered a feminine color but it can also be seen as uh, compassionate. In some cases, it can resemble feminine strength and sophistication. Purple is often used as a luxurious color that shows off royalty and ambition, but it can also be used playfully, especially if you're working with uh, very modern designs. I love working with the color purple. Brown is a very difficult color to work with, but in the right place, it can come off as really sleek and classy. It can also be simple, dependable, but you just have to make sure you're choosing the correct shade of it. Black, as you all know, is a great way to show formality, but when used boldly, it can also be very dramatic. And white is, um, of course, simple, clean, and honest. So, here I'm just showing you a couple of examples because I am a really big fan of choosing one color for my presentations and then working with multiple shades of that color. This doesn't mean you have to keep things way too simple, but you can work with we can, you can work with up to five or six different shades of gray in this example or even blue. Uh, I do recommend that. In this case, I'm not counting black as a color when I when I talk about color selection because we mostly use black for text anyway. But in these examples, um, they're using mostly shades of gray and maybe a little bit of blue in here. But keeping it simple is always the way to go. Don't go too crazy with your colors. Don't mix too many colors together. Yeah, so. Moving on to mixing colors. If you're looking to use more than one color in your presentation, you have to make sure that they complement each other and not collide with each other. So there are many awesome resources to help you do that. I'm not going to get into the color wheel because I don't even use that myself. Um, nowadays, everything is available. So one example is the website you see here on the slide. Uh, it's called coolers.com. So Coolers is one of the many platforms that allows you to pick and match your colors. You can generate random colors or you can choose one color of your choice and search for its matches. And as you can see here, um, I don't know if it shows, but you can copy this code is called the hex code. This is the code that you can copy from here and paste into your color selector on whatever software you're working with. The color will be exactly what you're seeing here. So as I was saying before, I don't recommend using more than two colors or maybe three, depending on how you're using them. But uh, especially if it's a formal presentation, try to stick with one or two. 
Uh, ideally, having two colors that complement each other in addition to the standard black text is, is more than enough. Less is more. So contrast. Always aim for high contrast, especially when text is involved. Whenever you're choosing a color for your background or a certain element that contains text, always, always aim for high contrast. Low contrast in instances, like you can see here, uh, the examples on the left, it, they can be very frustrating to your audience and show poor design skills. Now on the right, you can see examples of appropriate amount of contrast between colors, which offers comfort to the viewer and allows for more easy uh, readability. This also can apply to photos if you're placing text on photos. I'm going to show you an example later on. Um, it can also apply to icons, so make sure your icons, as you can see here with uh, like my red X and my green check, they're not very bright, but it's the right amount of contrast. You don't have to squint or anything to look at these or to read the examples here uh, on the right, sorry. I'm going to just uh, go over uh, a couple do's and don'ts. So here on the left, uh, if you can notice the image is stretched, so you're changing the ratio of your dimensions. This is a big no-no. Whenever you want to resize your image, make sure you're maintaining your dimensions or your ratio. So you're enlarging while pressing shift or actually uh, Google Slides and PowerPoint, I think they allow you to enlarge with the same ratio without pressing shift while you're enlarging. So just make sure you're not stretching your images because if it's visible, it just doesn't look good as you can see here. Um, so the same goes with text. As you can see here on the left, the text is stretched and it just looks weird. Here it's maintaining its dimensions. So I, I was talking before about people who design fonts. They, they really study the weight of each letter and how it corresponds with the letters next to it. So when you're stretching fonts, you're corrupting all of that. <laughs> so make sure whenever you're enlarging or uh, decreasing the size of your text elements, just maintain the ratio and enlarge by, by increasing and decreasing points, not by enlarging um, the text box itself. This is an example of contrast on images. So here on the left, we not only have low contrast, so you're writing and the person here wrote in black text on uh, an image that has red and green and it's just everything is clashing with, the, with each other. And you can just easily um, see that this is very hard to read. But here on the left, the contrast is high and you can easily read the word written here. Um, I also want to say that please avoid writing long text like this on images. If you want to place text on images, make sure it's either a title or something big um, that takes up a big space. But writing body of text on images, uh, even if it's in high contrast, almost all of the time, it's just very uncomfortable to look at, as you can see here on the left. So our final do and don't, as you can see here on the left, this is a very overly decorative list uh, of, of bullet points. There's just no need to go really over the top like this and use different colors and like different, there are like at least five or six different shapes in here. Um, this is on the right, this is an example of a slide I was showing you before, just keeping it simple, having maybe um, a number on the top and then a small subtitle, a small text below it. Um, don't go overboard with, with your elements. So keeping simple icons and lists. Um, so for, for professional design work, I usually use uh, Adobe apps like InDesign, Illustrator, Photoshop. But when I want to quickly create a simple presentation like the one I'm presenting right now, here are the software that I, that I usually work with. This is Google Slides. Google Slides for me is one of the best tools out there. It is so easy to use and the interface is very user friendly and it's very dynamic overall. Um, I found that working with a team is also easier on Google Slides. 
than, for example, using Outlook apps or um, the built-in PowerPoint on your on your laptop. Google Slides allows for easier real-time collaborations between multiple users. Um, it works perfectly even with a slow connection, which, which is a problem here. And you don't have to worry about uh, sending a PowerPoint file to someone who maybe doesn't have a compatible computer or laptop or something like this. So this is just a very flexible and user-friendly uh, interface to work with. Um, you can you can find some very classy templates to work with, and um, the elements can be easily customized and edited. Unlike Outlook, I really hate working on Outlook because um, when you choose a template, the elements in the template you can't edit them most of the time, and it's just uh, it's not flexible. Um, I would honestly always recommend for people to work with uh, software that are web-based, like Google Slides. Even if you're comfortable working with Outlook, um, make sure you're working on, on it web-based because other than facilitating uh, group work where you don't have to share files between each other, you can also rest your mind about losing any data stored, uh, stored on your computer because here everything is safe and sound on, um, on your drive on the web. Another amazing free tool I love to work with is Canva. If you're unfamiliar with Canva, it uh, offers a huge number of really beautiful templates you can that can get you started. And you can even find icons, as you can see here, elements, photos, text, audio, videos. It's just um, most of it is free. You also don't have to work with a template. You can easily start your presentation from scratch with all the tools available, as I showed you. Uh, it just generates very aesthetically pleasing results and um, allows you to create really, really cool animations. I don't know if you guys have been noticing how my slides have been animating. I, I created this on Canva. It might be a bit too artsy and designy for, for some people or for someone um, looking for something more technical. But for simple content, like what I'm presenting today, um, it's good and it helps you work faster. I'm going to mention a few useful resources that I usually uh, use for my designs, and then maybe I can hear some questions. So uh, apart from what I was talking about, like Google Slides and Canva, um, there are some wonderful resources out there where you can download free elements. Flat Icon is a website I've been using for years. Uh, although some of their elements require a paid subscription, the majority of the icons available are for free and you can even download uh, packs. So you can download a group of uh, icons that are all uh, consistent, they all look alike. This way you can maintain the consistency throughout your presentation. Um, they also offer a very wide variety of aesthetics. So you can, as you can see in the picture here, you can choose something that's colored. You can also go for uh, simple black and white icons, or you can also even filter out uh, if you want icons that are just outlines. They have uh, very good filtering options that you can work with. So it's flaticon.com. Uh, Sorry, can I ask a question? Yeah, for sure. Uh, about the icons, is it for free to download or it will contain a watermark? Do you have an idea? Uh, yeah, most of these are for free. The ones that aren't for free, they show you uh, an icon that says royalty, but 90% of everything on there is for free and uh, you, you have the option to download it as PNG, SVG, uh, whatever you're comfortable working with. You can choose the size without, of everything. Without watermark, right? Yeah, no watermarks, it's for free. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, please visit this website, flaticon.com. It's very useful and it's very easy to use. And like I was saying, um, royalty free, no watermarks on anything and easily customizable. So finally, this is Unsplash, unsplash.com. This is a free stock photo website. So if you're looking for high resolution images that are also royalty free and uh, without any watermarks, this is your go-to platform. They have a huge range of images that you can choose from um, and it's all for free. 
Their content is very high quality, which can be hard sometimes to find on a simple Google search. Um, and they have, they also have good search filters, so you can make things easier. So for example, if you're looking for something with a white background or with a transparent background, you can easily um, filter things out and um, find them here. So unsplash.com. And thank you guys. If you have any questions, please speak out and I'm, I'm going to check out uh, the Jamboard to see if anyone posted anything. OK. So are slide animations or transitions OK all through? As long as you're keeping it simple, like what I was doing here, I'm just going to go back. So this is a simple fade in animation. As long as you're keeping things, uh, as I said, simple, then that's OK. Don't um, also keep it consistent. So don't use different kinds of animations for each slide. It's going to be distracting and it's going to look tacky. Just keep it simple, keep it consistent, use the same animation all throughout and don't use anything crazy. Um, so is it fine to underline keywords or go for bold type? Yeah, for sure. If you're if you're writing um, a body of text and you want to sort of emphasize certain words, you can um, you can either make them italic. You can also underline them or go for bold. But I do not recommend having entire um, blocks of text in bold or or having them too thin. Try to keep it uh, in the middle. Try to have a comfortable um, look to it so you can easily read read what's being written. This goes for bodies of text, not for titles. I hope I answered that question. Um, do we indicate the source of online images used on the last slide uh, of the presentation? Do you mean giving credit to where you got the images from? Well, if you mean giving credit to uh, the images, so this is why I was telling you guys about Unsplash because they're royalty free. You don't have to give credit to, to anyone, but it's always risky when you download and use random images from the web because they can be copyrighted. So I encourage you to use something like, like um, Unsplash where you don't have to credit uh, um, the artist or the author. Uh, same goes for a flat icon. Uh, is it nicer to embed a video in a presentation or just open it externally? I think it depends, but I do encourage embedding a video in a presentation as long as um, you do it in a way that looks good and make sure to test it out because a lot of instances um, you, you pres you're presenting your presentation and you have a video embedded and you press play and the sound doesn't come up for everyone else. So if you're presenting remotely, just make sure that the sound, maybe give it a test with a, with a friend or something and make sure that the sound is working because this is an issue that, that happens a lot. So uh, yeah, I do encourage uh, for embedding um, videos in your presentations. Thank you a lot for an appealing presentation, actually. I thank you very much for all the information, Lean. That was too interesting and smooth at the same time. Thank you.